Good morning and welcome to worship on the Tom Goldsmith Plaza at First Unitarian Church. My goodness, it's good to be together, isn't it? Look around you. These are your people. They've been here all along. We were there for each other all last year. No pandemic can keep us down. We're still here for each other now. So I invite you to turn to each other and say, thank you for being there for me. For those of you joining us online this morning, thank you for being there for us as well. We're here for each other, even when we can't see or hear each other. And if you're joining us for the first time today, no matter where you are or how you are joining, thank you for being here. There's no better way to begin a day than in gratitude, right? And we have so many people to thank for this morning's service. I especially want to lift up our administrative team, Margaret Kosserak and Stephanie Park. Have you met these ladies? If you haven't met them, you really should because they're amazing and we couldn't do what we do without them. And let's thank Tristan Moore as well. He's our tech wizard and making all the magic happen. Now, doing outdoor worship is a learning experience, right? One thing we learned this morning is that it takes a long time for us to set up for outdoor worship. So, we could use some extra help at the nine o'clock service, setting up chairs, helping to set up for music and tech things. So if you'd like to skip the ticket rush and come to the nine o'clock service, volunteer to help your community and do something that's fun and makes you feel good, please email me or see me after the service about helping out at nine o'clock and I'll get you on the list. And thank you to each of you for being patient with us as we learn how to do church in all new ways. They don't teach pandemic ministry in seminary. Shocking, but true. So we're all learning together and we appreciate your kindness and your acceptance of little bumps along the way. Thank you also for keeping your mask on while you're on campus, whether you're indoors or outdoors. It's a sign to others that you care about them and that this little inconvenience is worth it to protect each other and our community, especially our children and their parents. Thank you. I have just a couple of announcements as we get started. First of all, we're not passing a plate this morning for donations, but you can still make them. We will still take your money. Yeah, so at the welcome table in the back, you'll see a poster, two posters actually, that show you how to make a one-time gift via PayPal. You can also use that if you wanna purchase a mask, if you ever forget one when you get here. Or you can download our Givelify app that helps you to manage all your gifts to the church, including a plate donation, or your pledge, or money for RE, or money to buy all those great things they're gonna sell at Christmas time to raise money for the program. It all goes to support the community that you love. So thank you for doing that. And as I said last week, it is the season of registration. If you haven't registered your kids for RE yet, now is the time. It's also the time to register for small group ministry. We ask that you do it every year, even if you've been in your same small group for 15 years. Please do your registration again so that we've got your most up-to-date information and we can get you in the right group. Uh, the small group ministries will start in October and we want everybody to be a part of it. Now, let us settle into the spirit of worship tuning our hearts to receive and to share, lighting a flame within as we hear these words from the Unitarian community of Rio de Janeiro. We light this flame as a reminder of our mission of being a light in the world, in unity with those who came before us, 
with whom we are a spiritual family, we shall be able to commit to the building of a community of free faith beyond geographical limits and personal beliefs. May we be a shelter to all who need it the most. Our soloist this morning is Makwena Malakolo, who some of you know. Uh, as we mentioned last week, we'll be singing the same hymns throughout the month, and Makwena is here to serve as sort of a cantor, so that we can sing inside while she sings aloud to us. to the sustainer of the universe who has created us and made us into different tribes and nations that we may know each other not that we may despise each other if your enemy inclines toward peace you must also incline toward peace and trust in God for the provider is the one who hears and knows all things and the servants of the compassionate are those who walk on the earth in humility and when their enemies address them, they respond, peace. 
With these words from the Holy Quran, we remember today the tragedy of September 11th, 2001. For every person who lost a life on that day, we remember. For every person with a hole in their life, a loved one gone or forever missing or damaged by the trauma, we remember. For every helper who ran toward the smoke and rubble toward the horror and pain and grief we remember. For every person who suffered religious or racial persecution in its aftermath, for every person who still suffers, we remember. For every person still languishing in the belly of Guantanamo Bay, while war profiteers count their money, we remember. For every mother's child sent off to fight a never-ending war, and for those who didn't make it home, we remember. For every child born after, who must hear the story and decide how it will influence their future, we remember. And for each of us who still, after all this time, refuse to take up the sword of vengeance, who commit ourselves to peace, may we remember. Praise be to the sustainer of the universe who has created us and made us into different tribes and nations that we may know each other. Amen. What wondrous things came nearer. I called my soul and asked her to dive down into the floods, whose distant roaring I could hear. This happened on the 22nd of January in the year 1914, as recorded in my black book. And thus she plunged into the darkness like a shot, and from the depths, she called out, Will you accept what I bring? I will accept what you give. I do not have the right to judge or to reject. So listen. There is old armor and rusty gear of our fathers down there, murderous leather trappings hanging from them, worm-eaten lance shafts, twisted spearheads, broken arrows, rotten shields, skulls, the bones of man and horse, old cannons, catapults, crumbling firebrands, smashed assault gear, stone spearheads, stone clubs, sharp bones, chipped arrowhead teeth, everything the battles of yore have littered the earth with. Will you accept all this? I accept it. 
You know better, my soul. I find painted stones, carved bones with magical signs, talismanic sayings on hanks of leather and small plates of lead, dirty pouches filled with teeth, human hair, and fingernails, timbers lashed together, black orbs, moldy animal skins, all the superstitions hatched by dark prehistory. Will you accept all this? I accept it all. How should I dismiss anything? But I find worse. Fratricide, cowardly mortal blows, torture, child sacrifice, the annihilation of whole peoples, arson, betrayal, war, rebellion. Will you also accept this? Also this, if it, if it must be. How can I judge? I find epidemics, natural catastrophes, sunken ships, raised cities, frightful, fearful savagery, famines, human meanness and fear, whole mountains of fear. So shall it be since you gave it. I find the treasures of all past cultures, magnificent images of gods, spacious temples, paintings, papyrus rolls, Sheets of parchment with the characters of bygone languages, books full of lost wisdom, hymns and chants of ancient priests, stories told down through the ages, through thousands of generations. That is an entire world whose extent I cannot grasp. How can I accept it? But you wanted to accept everything? You do not know your limits. Can you not limit yourself? I must limit myself. Who could ever grasp such wealth? Be content and cultivate your garden with modesty. I will. I see that it is not worth conquering a larger piece of the immeasurable, but a smaller one instead, a well-tended small garden is better than an ill-tended large garden. Both gardens are equally small when faced with the immeasurable, but unequally cared for. Take shears and prune your trees. This is a passage of a dialogue between Carl Jung and his soul his connection to the eternal as recorded in his Red Book. It took place about a year after he began having apocalyptic visions, visions so terrifying he thought he was having a psychotic break. He saw oceans swallowing up all of Europe. Death was everywhere. But when World War I broke out, he realized it was not a personal psychosis, but something precognitive. He had somehow unwittingly tapped into what he called and what has become known to us as the collective unconscious, the spirit of the depths, the timeless, the oceanic, the source. To stare unabated into the maw, into the source, can be frightening. And Jung was frightened. But fortunately for us, he was also courageous and chose to dive into the visions as a scientist. And there he found Salome, his soul, his companion. Together they explored the depths which created the foundations for his work. The Red Book is a narration of his journey of discovery which returns again and again to the tension between the spirit of the times, our lived reality as individuals, and the spirit of the depths, the deep unconscious. And his conclusion through dialoguing with his soul is that if you want to shift the planet, the shift occurs within the single individual. And this happens not through asceticism, nor stress-reducing mindfulness techniques, both of which are forms of separation, but instead we are called 
to do the spiritual work, the deep spiritual work that rejects nothing, that rejects none of the horrors nor the treasures that Salome chronicled in the dive into the unconscious. It is in the rejecting of these parts that they become projected into the world. Our wars are the fruit of projection. Our external fighting is the manifestation of something we don't want to fight within ourselves. The spirit of the times is upon us again. And I have been thinking about Jung's journey as something of a mirror. A little over a hundred years ago, we were engulfed in the greatest war in common memory, perhaps ever. And while the battle raged in Europe, it impacted the entire globe. And Jung's personal crisis was deeply aligned with the crisis of the world. And so it is with each of us today. Our personal crises are deeply aligned with the crisis of the world. And the future of humanity will be guided by the decisions we make in this moment. This can either exist as an era of loss, a harbinger of the end, or it can exist as an alchemical opportunity where we turn our waste into gold. What it cannot be is a return to how it was. There is a grave temptation to believe that with a little social distancing, by washing our hands, by wearing our masks, we will be able to wait out this storm and eventually the waters will recede and life will return to the way that it was. But yesterday is over. To try to live into yesterday is a delusion. But COVID is not the issue. Just as climate change is not the issue, just as the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are not the issue, just as the Supreme Court is not the issue, just as the air quality in the Salt Lake City Valley is not the issue. The issue is the failure to understand how we are killing our soul and how it is showing up as COVID, as climate change, as endless war, as the duality of politics, as air pollution. The root of the endless drive for productivity and consumption are the discarded and rejected aspects of ourselves that we choose not to address. It is this choice that is killing our soul and wreaking havoc on the world. We can fear it and run away, or we can breathe and dive into it. But the spirit of the times, either way, has called us to attention. It will not be like it was before, but the future is unwritten. There are those who in their cataloging of the spirit of the times point to COVID, to climate change, to the refugee crisis, to the howling out, the hollowing out of the American economy as consequences of our indifference to one another. But there are also those who in the cataloging of the spirit of the times interpret this moment as an opportunity to expand our understanding of community, to stretch beyond who we have understood ourselves to be, to surrender our fantasies of control, to embrace the quest that draws us ever closer to one another. Father James Keen writes, our sin is usually not in what we did, not in what we could not avoid, not in what we tried not to do. Our sin is usually where you and I are comfortable, where we do not feel the need to bother. In our indifference, the chickens have come home to roost. We are caught 
within a spiritual crisis of perceived separation and indifference that has created the external crisis of planetary chaos. And it is this spiritual journey into, the in, into interconnection and unselfishness that will guide us into recreating the global community. But the spiritual journey isn't for others to take, those out there who really need it. It is for me to take, and it is for you to take. It is within our personal commitment to nurture our relationship with the eternal that the world becomes committed. When Father Keenan writes, we do not feel the need to bother, I do not hear him saying that we merely need to donate more money, but that there is a certain comfort in our spiritual separation. It is because I feel comfortable in my separation from you that I am able to be indifferent to you. It is in my comfort in my separation from you that allows me not to bother. But if we take the time to listen, we will see that we are not that comfortable at all. The crisis writ large is the manifestation of the spiritual crisis we do not wish to address within ourselves. We can either be those who wail at the consequences, or we can be those who understand this moment as an opportunity to expand, to grow beyond the limitations of yesterday. Recently, I learned of a set of experiments conducted by the Canadian psychologist and researcher Bruce Alexander. Several years ago, he recreated experiments where rats had been isolated in metal cages and they were given the opportunity to choose either uh, water and food or hard drugs like heroin and cocaine. And the previous experiments had indicated how addictive these drugs were because increasingly the rats would choose the drugs. Alexander's insight was to suggest that perhaps it wasn't the drugs, but the cage that was the problem. In what has become known as the Rat Park Experiment, Alexander placed rats in a large rat-friendly environment with other rats and found that the animals almost never chose the heroin. It was his work as a psychologist counseling addicts that inspired him to recreate these experiments. His patients told him that they took drugs to escape emptiness, despair, meaninglessness. His conclusion was not that the drugs were so inherently addictive that beings could not escape their allure, but that there was an inner poverty these beings sought to escape that made the drugs attractive and habit-forming. And in so many ways, it has been easier for us as a culture to look at the myriad addictions of the world and isolate them as external problems rather than ask if they are the result of some inner poverty brought about by the cages of emptiness, despair, and meaninglessness in our cultures. What we do know is that despite having more education, more policing, more medical research than we have ever had when it comes to drugs and drug addiction, there are nearly four million people in the United States who use heroin, which is a five-fold increase from what it was a decade ago. What would it mean to address the cage of our existence instead of pathologizing people? What would it mean to recognize that this isn't a problem isolated in addicts, but a spiritual distress that we are all living with? The Unitarian theologian James Luther Adams, witnessing the atrocities of the Nazis and the impotence of the Christian church to stand up to them, riffed on the famous line by Luther proclaiming a priesthood of all believers and proclaimed a prophethood of all believers as well. It is our spiritual duty, he said, to reject complacency and stand up for justice. And Unitarian Universalists embrace this wholeheartedly. We are, as a faith, pretty prophetic. But JLA didn't ask us only to be prophets. Prophecy alone is not enough. He didn't think Luther was wrong, just that he didn't go far enough. But in the call to prophesize, 
we seem to have left behind some of the priesthood. And this is a shame, as it truly is one of the great insights of the Reformation and a foundational moment in the awakening that led to Carl Jung, the son of a Protestant pastor, to the entrance of his cave of meaning. Today marks the first gathering of this community for in-person worship in a very long time. It's important to ask, why have we gathered? Is it because we seek to return to the way it was? To reclaim some normalcy? To restore some sense of control in a world that feels out of control? Who could say that we were wrong for wanting these things? But I believe the spirit of the times is asking for more from us than that. Because in return, because to return to the way it was three years ago is also a return to the cage. It feels like this is the cage, this COVID life is the cage, but actually it's the opportunity. It's the opportunity to see that the cage was already within us. It is an opportunity to dive within and to reclaim what it means to be a member of the priesthood of all believers again. Where each of us, not just Monica and David and I, right, where each of us is responsible for bringing hope to our world. Sister Mary Kerber writes, hope is not the same as optimism. Hope finds a place in our lives where we can live beyond ourselves. The times of crisis can lead us to despair or they can invite us to use all of the resources within us and outside of us to find the sturdy shelter. Hope is not always a feeling, it's a choice. And when we intentionally make that choice from moment to moment and begin to act on it, even when the feelings aren't there, it begins to seep into our spirits and we begin to see life from a very different perspective. Two weeks ago, I told you a story about how I preached a sermon for my certification as a Unitarian Universalist minister that was called, There Are No Unitarian Universalists. Now, that's both true and not true. I am ordained in the Unitarian Universalist faith. I am a Unitarian Universalist. And in the linear understanding of history of, of this world, there are Unitarian Universalists. That's true. But also, there is no Unitarian Universalist path into the depths, just as there is no Christian path, no Mormon path into the depths. There are lenses that we can use to help interpret the journey, but only you can ford the threshold into the depths of being. I cannot do it for you. Monica cannot do it for you. David cannot do it for you. Jesus cannot do it for you. The Buddha cannot do it for you. Only you can walk that journey. We all have our own paths. No one has walked the path that you were chosen to walk. but you have a companion. Jung called her Salome. My companion is called my darling. You also have a companion to help your journey into the depths. The trouble is the world is so loud with projection and we have been so poorly trained that most of us do not know how to listen for the companion who can help us on the journey inward. But if we are to meet the spirit of the times, then we must explore the spirit of the depths. And to explore the spirit of the depths, 
you must listen to your companion as she is the link to the eternal. No person, no religion teaches us how to be in deep relationship with our partners, sacred or otherwise. Each of us in our own way has to learn this for ourselves and we learn by being in relationship with listening. Let us not use today to live into the shell of what was. Like someone who reminisces only of what his life was like when he played quarterback in high school. Let us use today to realize that we have been called by the spirit of the times to dive into the spirit of the depths and discover who we are called to be. You do not have to do this alone. Not if we recommit ourselves to the priesthood of all believers. All of us, each of us is here to take up that journey. And if we actively listen for the sacred companion who exists within and links us to the eternal, well, then we are able to stretch and live beyond ourselves so that we might bring hope to this world. Amen. Source of life, God, my darling, inspire us as we leave this first gathering to walk amongst the world as people, as priests of the worth and dignity that lives in every being. Awaken us to the eternal, to that great encounter that lives, that exists beyond life and death. and fill us with grace so that we might put down the limitations that show up in the form of no or fear. These are just walls of the cage. Fill us with grace so we might be the people who bring the hope to the world. With this, we extinguish our chalice and the end of the service.